Hi, this is Jeff Comus, and I'm here to talk with you today about one of my favorite subjects, the guitar. In this case, specifically, we're going to talk about the history of the guitar. The guitar, the, well, stringed instruments, really, they go back centuries. And I guess we could say any stringed instrument with, with a, a neck or, or any stringed instrument, which is officially uh, classified as a chordophone, if you want to remember that, chordophone, and um, which basically means it has a chord or a string, right? So anyway, but when we, when we look at instruments, the closest thing we can find to what is now the modern guitar goes back to the 15th century in an instrument called the malaga, which is um, an instrument that is actually tuned, uh, from what we can tell from, from records, it was tuned much like the ukulele is tuned today, and it used uh, it used courses, which um, is is something. If you're not familiar with that, when we play like two strings at a time that are tuned to the same note, that's a course. So you play it like one string, but the two strings make it louder, and they they weren't very good at being loud with the instruments then. Now let's go ahead and move up to the uh, to the the Renaissance, or the Renaissance, is one of my music professors sometimes called it. Um, anyway, there's an instrument called the vuela. Now, in, in my schooling, I was taught that the vuela, the vuela, if I'm pronouncing it right, vuela, is is the um, that it is the it's the closest ancestor um, to the. Uh, to the modern guitar, and it, it, it towards the end of the the Renaissance, a fifth string or a fifth course actually was added, and it was so that made it one step closer to the modern guitar because the the malaga had four courses, the viola started out with four, and then a fifth was added, and it was typically tuned to A, which also made it very close to the modern guitar, uh, which has six. Strings, but the lowest is is uh, the sixth string is E, but the fifth string is A, the same as the Fuela. Around the end of the Baroque era, which would be 1750, we have the first appearance of what would be uh, the modern guitar. It's very similar to this guitar that we have here. This is a classic guitar style or a classical guitar, and this guitar. Uh, well, the excuse me. If I go back to the to the end of the Baroque era guitar, the first appearance of the guitar with six strings, six individual strings instead of courses. Uh, they were a bit thin. They were smaller and not quite as thick as this, and so they didn't. They still were not as loud. They were considered a parlor parlor instrument, which just basically means it's meant to play in a small place. Um, Really not uh, not a royal instrument, kind of more of a folk instrument. But anyway, so this... A, uh, this is the closest uh, we have to to the original guitar. This is a classic guitar style. Uh, this particular one, I just I actually really love. It's a uh, it's not a particularly fancy classical guitar. It's actually made by a piano company. It's made by the Baldwin Piano Company, and they didn't make a lot of guitars. And this one, uh, interestingly, has the uh, well. I took the pickup off. But it has the same one that Willie Nelson used on his guitar, or it did have it. By the way, somebody paid me a lot of money for it. I didn't really like the sound of it, uh, so I, I have modified this whole instrument and uh, just put a, a regular classical bridge on it because I love the way it sounds, and it's got a slightly smaller than normal scale, and I love the way it plays, and it's got a sweet high-end voicing, not quite as rich in the bass, but it's, it's a really nice instrument. Anyway, let me move uh, forward a little bit, and I'm going to basically show you 
another evolution, and we're actually kind of skipping ahead slightly on this, but the, um, the this is a basically a classical guitar, but it has this cutaway which allows access to higher notes. So that was really easy to play on this guitar, whereas on a, cla on a, on a standard classical, which cuts off at the 12th fret, uh, it's harder to reach those high notes. So it gives us a little more range. This actually also has, if you see this gear here, um, this is a little electronic. So if I have to do it like a wedding gig where a lot of people are talking, it gives me a little extra boom for allows me to play with a larger group or like if I wanted to play with an orchestra or something like that. The next step in the evolution of the guitar would be in about 1840s, uh, a guy named Christian F. Martin who, uh, for short, C.F. Martin, we all know the Martin Guitar Company now or people who play guitar know the Martin Guitar Company. They're one of the uh, most successful guitar companies in the world and they've been in operation since the mid-1800s. And uh, Christian Martin developed something called the X brace which was basically just a brace that made an X underneath this part called the soundboard that was a lot stronger than the conventional bracing of the day and it allowed the new technology that was coming in with the industrial revolution of the world, uh, where we were learning to use, to make steel wire and things like that. And so these these steel wires were um, these thinner steel wires and other things were adapted to the guitar and. the guitar to, to be a little louder. Uh, it has a bigger body. You might notice that this guitar is a little larger. It does have a cutaway, so it's got that modern innovation, but this is a called a dreadnought size. The, the, it joins the neck up two frets higher at the 14th fret instead of the 12th, and then it has a larger body. It allows it just the, the guitar to be to have more volume. So that was a big step forward really in, in the evolution of the guitar because it was it was a quiet instrument before. Modern innovations have made you know even classic guitars much louder than they used to be in the traditional uh, designs. But anyway, so uh, and then also behind that developed really a kind of a whole new style of guitar playing where we play with plectrum, or this is usually called a pick, but it's officially a plectrum, and um, I think the the uh, plural of, pit, of plectrum would be plectra. I have a plethora of plectra. Anyway, um, so, but let me move on to another interesting innovation. Something called the harp guitar. Whoa, that's crazy looking, right? So, this instrument was, uh, was well, when we look at the history, we find the first, really, the first evidence of a harp guitar, and that's basically a regular guitar with the, uh, the ba extra bass strings, which is what this is. It's just a guitar. <laughs> Here, regular guitar, and then it has six extra bass notes in the case of this instrument. Okay, and you hear, boy, it has that nice, rich sound down in the bass and gives us uh, great things like. And you hear, I can play that low bass note, and you hear how it rings out, and I can just play over it. Sound. Anyway, so um, the first evidence of a guitar or anything like that was in the late 1700s, as I mentioned. This would be 
what you would call the, the Knudsen or Knudsen. I've heard it pronounced both ways, and I'm not sure really which one is right. But uh, in uh, a guy named Chris Knudsen invented this instrument in uh, 1897, and it was the first instrument that was like a guitar that had this, excuse me, Mr. Takamini, uh, they had this horn or this, uh, as they call it, the hollow neck that goes up, which greatly expands the soundboard of the uh, of the guitar and gives it more volume and allows for these these low bass notes to ring out a little more. It's really a, really an attractive instrument. Um, Orville Gibson of the of the now very famous Gibson Company developed a competing instrument that was more like a regular guitar with extra strings and it just kind of had an extra arm sitting out here. Now, for uh, for reasons of just reason, I can't own everything. So I don't have one of those to show you. I'm sorry, but they're, they're very neat. Maybe someday I'll get one. All right, I want to move a step forward um, or maybe a step sideways. Talk very briefly about a couple of other instruments. Uh, this one would be the mandolin. And in a way, this is kind of like a marriage of the violin and the guitar. It has, it's tuned like a violin. It, it has courses, actually. This instrument has courses. So when I play this note, it's actually two strings. So that's, that's kind of like old-fashioned guitars. And then... Um, and then it's, but it's tuned like a violin. So it's tuned in fifths instead of fourths like a guitar. And mandolin quartets, uh, the, well, the mandolin, the modern mandolin really came about probably in a similar time to the steel string guitar, the steel string mandolin, because of the technology and, and so on. But uh, it also, it, this would have been in the, in the late 1800s when the, they first, or, or uh, viable instruments, that would be a good word. And they also had, so this is a, a mandolin, which is basically equal to a violin, but there was also an instrument called a mandola, which is equal essentially to a viola, and the mandocello, which is tuned just like a cello. And in the late 1800s or early 1900s, Violin quartets were, were very popular, like they were like pop music. So, and um, in the States, we kind of tend to think of this as like a bluegrass instrument, but it's really, it's, its origins are in Italy. So you can play uh, real folky bluegrass music, or you can play Italian music on your mandolin. Very briefly, I would like to talk about the ukulele, or as it would be more properly pronounced, ukulele. Ukulele. Uh, this is an instrument whose origins are in Hawaii, but it really comes from. Uh, it was. It came from an instrument that Portuguese sailors brought to the island, and it's very actually closely related to the malaga that we talked about earlier. Um, I forget the name of the instrument, actually, that the Portuguese brought, but the Hawaiians adapted it into the, the modern ukulele. Okay, and so um, the, the ukulele, depending on who you ask, means either jumping flea, which um, I spoke with somebody who speaks Hawaiian, and they said, yes, that's what that means. But uh, the queen of Hawaii once called the, the ukulele, she said it meant the gift, as I guess the gift from the Portuguese sailors. Maybe she was just being uh, very diplomatic. All right, so now let's take a big step forward. Let's go to, we're going to really step into the 20th century, which seemed modern recently, but now it's last century anyway. But... Uh, Let's talk about the electric guitar. I'm gonna reach over and grab my electric guitar as I get ready to talk about it. Now the first electric guitar, well there was 
talk of electric guitars going back into the late 1800s and early electricity. People used microphones and other uh, things with guitars along the way, but the first evidence we really have of, of a, what I would consider the electric, the modern electric guitar, which is a, a guitar, uh, a, a chordophone with stringed instruments like this that uses a magnetic pickup. Now, what's a pickup? Well, these things that I'm pointing at here are pickups. Basically, they are a magnet with these copper wires, tiny little copper wires wrapped around it thousands of times or hundreds anyway. And when we play a note, and I'm going to turn it up a moment, and we're going to listen. We hear a note, and I've got, you know, you can't see it from here, but I've got an amplifier over there. If I didn't use the amplifier, you could barely hear it. Not very loud at all. So, back to the pickup. The pickup is this magnet with these wires. When I plug that string with my plectrum, it, uh, it vibrates and it interrupts the magnetic field and creates a, an electronic signal that is analogous to the sound of it. And so then we, we send that to the amp and it, it, it amplifies it. And of course, this, uh, you know, as, as technology was developing, uh, people wanted to play guitars, they wanted them to be louder. And so the, uh, in about 1920, a guy named Adolf Rickenbacker, of the, the very famous and still in business Rickenbacker Company uh, invented something that we now call the frying pan guitar, basically because it looked like a frying pan. And it would be probably closely related to what we would call a lap steel now. It looked like a frying pan. It, it looked like a big handle and had a, a round bowl. But it was the first instrument to have a magnetic pickup like this, at least as far as I can find out in my research. So anyway, that was the frying pan guitar. It was pretty crude, and it didn't really, really, really catch on. Um, it just, uh, you know, it, it didn't really catch on till later. It was, I guess it was noisy, and there was other problems, and it was kind of used for some Hawaiian music, but it wasn't, it wasn't real popular. Later, in about 1940, a guy named Les Paul, now, if you play guitar, you probably heard that name because one of the most famous guitars in the world, one of the most common guitars in the world, people that aren't even, aren't even guitar players, they know about them. Um, Les Paul made something that he called the log, which was basically he took a regular acoustic guitar, he took his bandsaw and he cut it in half and cut the body off and then he put a big log, a four by four piece of wood, and he put a magnetic pickup on it, and he put the bridge on there, and then he glued the sides of the old guitar to the four by four, and he called it the log. And that was really the first modern electric guitar. Now, he tried to sell that to some companies, and people kind of poo-pooed him and said, you know, no, that's never gonna catch on. About 1946, another guy named Leo Fender went uh, started working on another instrument. And uh, you might, if you can read, I don't know if you can, but it says Fender right here. And the Fender Guitar Company is actually still in business. He founded it in 1946 and started working on his design for the first electric guitar that he called the Broadcaster. And it was the actually the first electronic guitar, or the electric guitar, first to ever be mass produced. And that was in 1948. And uh, it later became called the Telecaster, and that's a guitar the Fender company still makes. And this is one of the, it's probably the third most popular electric guitar body style in the world still. All right, so, but Les Paul uh, had, meanwhile, Les Paul had, had previously been talking to the Gibson Company and first they kind of said, oh, you know, nah, that electric guitar thing, that's, that's not gonna stick. 
Uh, but Leo Fender was having a lot of success, and so the Gibson Company didn't want to be left out. So they went back to Les Paul with his uh, about his design for the log instrument, and he, they came up with the Les Paul, which is the name of the guitar, and it's probably the second most popular guitar style body style today. It looks it looks really a lot like uh, one of my guitars with the cutaway. It was an electric guitar. Had a longer neck, a solid body, and uh, had the, the cutaway, and it's a very attractive guitar. Uh, the solid body, by the way, keeps more of the energy in the string and makes the guitar's notes sustain longer, which is one reason for electric guitar, aside from being louder, because um, my electric guitars, like they played in, in like jazz bands, and they were in the rhythm section, and they would have these big fat guitars that were like pretty loud by acoustic guitar standards but you get a big band with a drummer and a piano player and a bass player and a bunch of horns and stuff and you know basically nobody could hear you they they play with these giant strings and they beat the heck out of these four guitars and still is like what is it well eventually you know they wanted to to be able to be heard and this is kind of what led to to Leo Fender's and Les Paul's inventions is to, to try to get the guitar to be louder, to be able to compete with louder instruments because the guitar was always a quiet instrument. You remember earlier I talked about it being a parlor instrument. Okay, so anyway, by 1952, the Gibson Company had, had worked out something with Les Paul and Les Paul went to market. Now, Leo Fender being a competitive guy and manufacturer, he didn't want to be outdone with that. So by 1954, he went to market with something called the Stratocaster. Now that's what this is. This is a Fender Stratocaster. It is the most popular uh, guitar style, I guess, in the world. Uh, you know, the, the Stratocaster is a, is a name that's owned by the Fender company. But this body style, this, this offset, double cutaway, uh, the, the beveled thing here, which is very comfortable for your arm, and something that was pretty innovative at the time, that he came up with this thing called the, the uh, it, well, officially it's called a vibrato bar. Because we can take the notes and we can move them like a vibrato, like a, when a violin player wiggles his fingers back and forth or a guitar player would go we wiggle our the note well you can do that with this bar but it, you could do it like whole chords and and you could go down which was previously you couldn't really do on a fretted vibrato i guess violin players could do it a little bit but certainly not to this extent Listen, I'm going to take it and just drop it to the bottom. And basically, it's so low there, we can't even hear it. So, and uh, despite what some people may, may think, you can actually often reset your, your tuning using the... Uh, vibrato bar, which most of us actually call the whammy bar these days. Sometimes it's mistakenly called a tremolo arm, but it doesn't actually produce tremolo, it produces vibrato. Um, so anyway, the Strat, this is my main axe, and by axe I mean the tool I work with, and uh, I've been playing this guitar since I bought it in 1991. It's been a great instrument. Um, so anyway, let me move on to another instrument. And I'm gonna, it may be a little loud while I unplug this and plug in another instrument, which is just a variation of the electric guitar. This one is a Dan Electro, which was, Dan Electro uh, was, is a company that was revised uh, not too long ago. It was. They made instruments in, in really the 1960s, and they were really kind of cheap instruments, but now they're, they're kind of collectible because they're, like, they're cool. Uh, 
th this instrument is a baritone guitar. So basically, it kind of splits the difference between a bass guitar and a, uh, an electric guitar, which uh, I haven't got to the bass guitar yet, but I will in just a minute. <laughs> Apparently it needs to be tuned a little bit, but we won't do deal with that right now. But it gets this really kind of groovy sound. It's a little lower, and I'm going to turn on all the volumes here so it doesn't make noise while I talk about other instruments. And I brought up the bass guitar. And we've been talking about Leo Fender. And this instrument is, is really a Leo Fender design. Now, if you're looking closely, you might see this says Ibanez. Whoops, my strap came loose there. Better take care of that. Thankfully, I caught it. So, this instrument is an Ibanez Challenger. Now, Ibanez is a Japanese company. And uh, in, in the guitar, in guitar land, we call this a pre-lawsuit uh, Ibanez because Sometime in the 1960s, or early 70s, I forget exactly when, there was a big lawsuit from the United States companies against these Japanese companies saying, hey, you can't make instruments that look exactly like ours and sell them in the United States. And that was eventually, uh, they had to change this. Usually the part, and I point up here, this is the part, if they change this, that was traditionally considered enough. Um, anyway, so... But this is just like Leo Fender's uh, precision bass design. And a, a bass guitar is basically tuned like the big bass, uh, the string bass, or sometimes called the double bass in the orchestra, those great big things you hear. Sometimes you see guys playing them with fingers in their jazz bands and stuff. Um, still a really cool instrument. But this is basically that same tuning. So it's got very low notes, and uh, it's really one of the most used instruments in the world these days. Uh, the guitar is very popular, the piano is very popular, but almost every uh, record that we would listen to does feature bass guitar uh, in, in popular music, or, or something doing the same purpose, but it's, it's, it's a very common instrument. Okay. So I got one more instrument I'd like to talk with you about today. And before I do, I have to grab my, my special tool belt. Why do I need a tool belt to play this instrument? Well, because this crazy instrument, you can probably see it right here, it's called a Chapman Stick. And to play the Chapman Stick, which is basically... I don't know, maybe it should have been called the Chapman Neck because it's just basically a giant guitar neck. Um, but it has a, a little belt hook. So I'm going to hook it on my belt hook here, which will hold it up for me. Put my strap on. And I don't need the pick for that because, okay, so why am I playing this instrument? Well, it has strings, it's a chordophone, it's very closely related to the guitar, but also, in a way, it's related to a piano. Well, why is that? Because it has this huge range, really low notes. I don't know if you can hear how low that is, but that's almost, almost as low as the lowest note on a piano. And then, that note, way up there, very high. So high, we can almost barely hear it. It's, like a little kitten or something. There's a big elephant and a little kitten. Okay, so anyway, but it has a range that's that almost is as, as big as the uh, the grand piano forte. Um, and so it has these strings and, and a magnetic pickup, a lot like a, an electric guitar. And if you play guitar, one thing that we can do on a guitar is something called a hammer-on. So instead of picking a note, we just play a note by kind of striking it. And on this instrument, we call that tapping. And by the way, this instrument is called a Chapman stick. It was invented by a fellow named Emmett Chapman um, in the 
late 1960s, he was playing jazz music, and he was a pretty successful performing musician, but he was he wanted something different, and he, he took his guitar, and he, he took it from the this position to this position, and then he added three strings to it, so it had nine strings, and he started playing it all with hammer-ons. And that eventually led, and he called it the freedom guitar. Now, as far as I know, he just had his own personal freedom guitar. It was never made in production, but he did start a company and in 1972, he started producing the Chapman Stick. And this is a really modern instrument as we look at the, the time frame of most instruments. You know, most of them that we know of have been around for, for you know, over 100 years. And this is, uh, well, still less than half a century. So, not much, though. I guess it'll be 50 years old in two years. So, we're getting close, if I'm doing my math right. Anyway, so... Can hear that wow it makes this really nice sound i like the way emmett emmett chapman put it and i've actually it was really neat i got a chance to meet him and he says that the stick is electric but it sounds acoustic and i really agree And we play it a lot like a piano in that we can use two hands. And so instead of playing like a guitar where one hand holds the notes and the other hand strums, with this instrument, we can play independently. So a lot like a piano player. We have those two independent hands. And uh, but then you got the independence, but we can do kind of guitar things with it too, like. You see, I can bend or vibrato notes. So it's a really fascinating instrument. Um, it takes a lot of practice and, you know, you can find more examples of any of these instruments on YouTube if you like. Uh, you could, I think it, you should look up the harp guitar and the Chapman stick. You find a lot of really interesting stuff, new music you probably never heard and ways you never heard it made. Anyway, so this has been Jeff Comas talking with you about the history of guitar and related stringed instruments. And I hope you enjoyed this talk. And I'll see you next time.